Good evening. Thankful to see everybody here. We're going to be continuing this evening with the, the vein of thought that we had this morning, which for those who are visiting with us, the intentions of the month are to address the works of the church. And today we talked about evangelism. And we pointed out from the mission statements of Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, as well as Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, that there is a theme and a task behind that theme, which every Christian is to go and to participate in. They're to go and make disciples of all nations. They're to go and to preach the gospel to the whole creation. They're to bring lost souls to Christ. And so as we try to uh, demonstrate how that had been done, we went through the book of Acts and we noted eight uh, different chapters in which we see conversions taking place. And we noted that the commonality between all of them is Christ is preached and people are obedient to Christ through baptism. That's how salvation occurs. And so then we talked about how it is that we could go and we could evangelize like the first century church. And it was simple. Follow the pattern and know what you're talking about. Know your Lord and practice right consistent Christianity now what we did when we talked about edification is we talked about edification the same sort of way we talked about evangelism and then we came back in the evening and we talked about Barnabas because Barnabas is a great example of what an edifier is and so tonight we want to talk about an evangelist and you know initially my thought was oh we'll just look at some evangelists in the book of acts but i was oh, i don't want to hit them with the whole coverage of the book of acts twice in one day and so we're probably going to save that for another time but as you begin to think beyond that you can think beyond the book of acts and you can think of several great evangelists paul for instance great evangelist timothy great evangelist silas great evangelist of course those three oftentimes spent time together evangelizing As many great evangelists there are that we can read of in the New Testament and we can infer that they were great evangelists, there's one who stands above them all. There's one who is by far the greatest at getting the name of Jesus out and causing people to believe in him. And that's Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is the master teacher. And there's some statements that help us to see uh, Jesus and the busyness uh, that he had. If we go to the book of Mark, and we look at Mark chapter 1, in Mark chapter 1, we see that Jesus has been healing a great number of people. He's been healing people of all manner of disease. And he finally takes the time to go and rest, to take some sleep. At least that's what's inferred in verse 34 or that's what's implied in verse 35 but it begins by saying and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark he departed to a desolate place and there he prayed and simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and said to him everyone is looking for you he's been healing people of disease He's been doing all sorts of many mighty, wonderful miracles for the benefit of man. And so all these men with these different varying cal calamities, these varying issues are trying to come to him. And you would think, okay, maybe Jesus would stay and Jesus would make this his hub. And everybody that wanted to know Jesus, they needed to come there. That's not Jesus' mentality on things. Verse 38, and he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus came for the purpose of preaching. What was he preaching? Well, you have Mark 1 and verse 15. He's preaching the kingdom of God, uh, that it is at hand. And so there is a need for them to repent and to believe in the gospel. He's preaching of himself and he's preaching of the response that people need to have to him. That's what he's doing. Jesus himself was preaching Jesus in obedience to his name, obedience to his will. 
And so as we go through the book of Mark, you continue, and there's a key phrase. We're not doing a survey in the book of Mark, so don't be alarmed. But if you go through the book of Mark, you have a key phrase there, which is the word immediately. And that shows us, again, the busyness of our Lord. He went and he went and he went, preaching and preaching and preaching, healing many, many people along the way, doing all sorts of many mighty, wonderful signs in order to demonstrate his deity, which is why Peter's able to say in, in Acts 2 and verse 22, a man attested to you by God with many mighty, uh, mighty signs and wonders. He showed himself as God through his miracles. He showed himself as God through his preaching as well. We think about Jesus and his preaching and this mentality that he had to go and to make the message known to so many folks. One passage that really sticks out perhaps in your mind and sticks out in my mind is John 4 and verse 34. When Jesus said, my food is to is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work we're going to have some more to say about that because we're going to be in john chapter 4 this evening and we're going to look here in john chapter 4 and we're going to look at some of the things that which you know they're trademarks of jesus's characteristic jesus's character as a as an evangelist and there's going to be things that we might see things we might notice that frankly we're going to have to change about ourselves and so that's really the way we're going to be looking at john chapter 4 we're going to be looking at it as if we want to evangelize like jesus then we need to change blank there's three things i thought of well, well back up there's three things i prepared a fourth thing i thought of but i'll let you stew on the fourth thing um if we're in john chapter 4 we might have some familiarity with the story jesus goes through Samaria, stops at a well, speaks with a Samaritan woman, has a discussion with her, reveals to her that he is the Messiah. She goes and reports to the village. The village comes out to greet him. He goes and stays with them in the village, and they have a change in, in their thought. In verse 42, it says, they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world that's the conclusion they're supposed to go or it's the conclusion they're supposed to get to whenever jesus came and he spoke with that woman when he planted the seed in that woman's heart and she shared it with those whom she knew though those whom she knew had the same need she had which was salvation so as we go through this three things that we need to change in order that we need in order that we might be evangelists like jesus it begins in verse four but we'll read verses one through four and that is that we need to change our plans that's one thing that must change it says now when jesus learned that the pharisees had heard that uh that jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than john although jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples he left Judea and departed again for galilee so he's traveling to a different region and he had to pass through Samaria so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph Jacob's well was there so Jesus weary as he was from his journey was sitting beside the well it's about the sixth hour so it's about noon time Jesus is now in Samaria he is next to Jacob's well he is thirsty Jesus changed his plans. Frankly, he changed his plans. He changed his plans as far as from how a normal, typical Jewish man would make his travel plans. Jewish man is traveling from uh, Judea to Galilee. The way in which they would travel is they would cross the Jordan River, actually. They would cross and they would go up through the eastern side of the Jordan River, which is the land of Perea, uh, which contained... Uh, the tribes of Gad, Dan, and the half tribes of Manasseh. That, that was their allotted land. And so typically that's where a Jewish man would go, or a Jewish woman would go, because they so heavily despised and hated the Samaritans. They wanted nothing to do with them. And so customarily they would bypass. So Jesus, whenever it says here in verse 4 that he had to pass through Samaria, it's not because he had some geographical, you know, this is the only way 
from point A to point B is you have to go through Samaria. He didn't have any geographical binding, but he had a spiritual binding as far as what he was sent to do. Jesus, we know, Luke 19, verse 10, was sent to seek and save that which is lost. <laughs> those in Samaria were comprised of those who were lost. The Samaritans were a people that were started after, uh, started with the leftovers of those who remained after the Assyrian captivity in 722 BC. They were mingled with the pagan Gentiles around them, the Canaanites, those who were in the land to whom God, God recognized that those people needed to be taken out of the land. Those people needed to be wiped from the land. And that's who the Samaritans became mingled with. That's how we get Samaritans, northern tribe Jews mixed with pagan Gentiles, pagan Canaanites. And so from 722 BC, and we can go even further because we look at the history of the northern tribe, guess what we see from its inception? Idolatry, false worship. And that's going to carry into the Samaritan religion. And so really starting all the way from the time in which we read in 1 Kings chapter says here are your gods that's where we have a very very serious spiritual meaning if we take 722 as a, a date of origination for the Samaritans and then we look at Christ and we factor in the fact that Christ is it is at some point early in his ministry, and so now he's 26, 27 years old. We're looking at nearly 750 years that the Samaritans have needed the truth. 750 years that the Samaritans were ignored by a nation, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, who were called to be priests to the whole world, bypassed. Utterly rejected generation after generation after generation. And so you have this, this group of people that have been lost for generations, hundreds of years. Of course Jesus is going to go to them. Of course Jesus had to go to them. They're lost in their sins. They're going to perish in their sins unless they repent. Jesus told us that in 13 verse 3. So of course he has to go to them. Of course he has to teach them. Because they are people with a spiritual need. People with a spiritual need. He came to seek and save souls. And that's where souls were. Remember in Mark 2 and verse 17, Jesus made a statement concerning why he came and, and to those whom he came. In Mark 2 and verse number 17, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So, of course, again, John 4, he has to go to Samaria. If Jesus has come not to deal with the righteous, but sinners, and we are lights of the world, we're the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of the gospel in this present age, are we not supposed to be looking, bear with me here, for the Samaritans? Are we not supposed to also be willing to go to Samaria? In many ways, we need to change our plans as far as evangelism goes. As far as evangelism goes, the way we like to do it sometimes is we like to go to places that look just like where we live. Every once in a while, we'll go into a mission field because it gives us a good story. We'll go into some places in the mission field that are crime-ridden, they are poverty-stricken, but we won't go to those same places in our own country. And that's an absurdity. We have a responsibility. Matthew 13, Mark chapter 4, Luke chapter 8, to sow the seed. We cannot look upon the soil and say, well, that soil's good, that soil's not good, that soil's good, that soil's not good. It teaches us that in that parable. We cast a seed wherever it might go, 
And what lies beneath the surface is what's going to dictate whether that is fruitful, prospective land. We can't go to a neighborhood and see it in shambles and say, well, if they live like that, they might be addicted to drugs. There's no way they want the gospel. I'll tell you a story. Uh, former director of Brown Trail, Robert Stapleton, he became the director of Brown Trail. He was a missionary in Africa for 20 some odd years. Whenever he was converted, he was a drug addict, him and his wife. That's a dynamic change. I'll tell you another story. There's a man who went out persecuting the church, killing them, and he became an apostle. That's all. The chief of sinners, foremost of sinners, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. And he was converted. He, he was allowed to be converted and go, get into that apostleship office in order that it might be evident that God's grace is for all men. God desires all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. And so we can't look at outward appearances and say, nope, can't go there. We can't listen to the rumors about an area and refuse to go there. Would you evangelize in my area? Most of you would. You know, like two months ago, one of the houses in my area was raided by the FBI and SWAT. Would it go now? Would it go still? Maybe because it looks more like our neighborhoods. But there's still sinful people in nice neighborhoods. And there's still good people in, in poverty-stricken neighborhoods. We cannot look at those external things and say, because of this, the way they look or the stories I've heard, I'm not going to go there. We have to be willing to go and share the gospel everywhere. The second thing here that we need to change, begin there in verse 7. It says, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked, uh, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. <coughs> Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give to him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when there is neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Will you worship the Father? You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and, the, and, and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He is called, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. 7 through 26, like you're reading. Here's what we need to gather from this. We need to change our preferences. You want to evangelize like Jesus, change your preferences. Look at what is stated about this woman and think about it from a carnal perspective. Think about it the way most of those Jews in Jesus' day were thinking about it. This is a woman. 
That's a major issue. That's a cultural issue. I, a Jewish man, am not supposed to be talking to an unattended woman. It's a cultural issue. She is a Samaritan woman. Now the cultural issue has just grown into a national issue. My people hate your people. My people despise your people. My people view your people as vile idolaters. She's an adulterous woman. She's with a man that's not her husband. You realize that's the point about her? She is living in adultery. She is not in a right marriage situation. That's a moral issue. The next thing is, here she is worshiping on the mountain that her fathers, the Samaritans, have told her to worship on. And she's worshiping what she does not know. This is a woman that is a false worshiper. And so now we have a cultural issue. We have a national issue. We have a moral issue. And we have a spiritual issue. These are issues that if we're honest with ourselves, we might even use as an, as an excuse to get us out of talking to someone like that. Oh, look at that person. They're all tied, tied up in denominationalism. Oh, look at that person. They're shooting up drugs and they're, and they're shacked up with their boyfriend. Look at that person. X, Y, and Z. How is Jesus viewing this woman? An opportunity. Jesus is viewing this woman as an opportunity. We need to change who we are willing to share the gospel with. Here's a question. Would we be willing to share the gospel with a sexually immoral person? Let's say we know someone, they have a, they have a reputation, and we, we might know it to be fact, that they are very sexually presumptuous. They go out committing all sorts of fornication. Would we try to evangelize that person? You have someone who is an idolater. I'll tell you what me and Hannah saw yesterday. Me and Hannah went to h and Saratoga, and we waited in line to get a low-cost vaccination for her dog, Carver. And then we went to HDO, which is right next to it. So two places within 30, 40 minutes. We see two people walking around very firmly with shirts about sat satanic worship. If you saw that person, would you try to evangelize them? Another question, would you try to evangelize to an adulterer? We're going door to door, you knock on the door, start talking with someone, then you get into the marriage conversation, and they say, well, you know, I was divorced, and I left my husband because he was drunk, and so now I found him, and we're married, and you just walk away. Do you say, well, you know, the marriage bond is such an emotional thing, I, do, I just know they won't. Just know they won't turn away from you. Would you try to evangelize to a homosexual? Again, H and B outside. A couple of homosexuals. Trans. Would you evangelize them? What about a thief? Would you try to evangelize to a thief? You know, someone's welcome in to your vehicle, maybe, or if someone has a reputation of, of, of being a thief, would you, if you know that to be true, would you try to evangelize to them? What about a drunkard? You, you see the same guy hobbling down the street with rope, out of his mind every night, yelling in his backyard. Are you going to knock on his door and you're going to offer him the gospel invitation? A reviler? That's someone who is blaspheming God, someone who speaks against God, an atheist, essentially. Would you try to evangelize to an atheist? What about a swindler? Someone who, who the way, their whole being of life is about getting money and other things out of people. Would you try to evangelize to them? Here's the reality. Most 21st century American Christians would not. Here's the other reality. That's the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Verse 10, such were some of you. 
and that's a church comprised of people that honestly today we might just completely reject them, completely refuse them, and not even give them a shot, not even give them an opportunity. We have to change our preferences. We can't go out looking for people that are just like us. And yet, sometimes that's exactly what we want. We have to change our criteria for who we go and evangelize to. You know, one of the most common ways congregations are growing is not evangelism. The local body of the congregation, most places, a lot of places, I'm not going to say most, a lot of places, it's not growing through evangelism. It's growing through swelling. I grew up in the DFW area. That's what happens. Congregation might be the prominent congregation for 10, 15 years. Then all their membership moves somewhere else. And then they move somewhere else. And it doesn't just happen by mistake. It's because you have ministers in place. I've seen it with my eyes. I've heard the pitches. And they go, hey, man, you need to come join our congregation over here. Look at what we're doing. Look what we're planning. Look what we have. Look what we can offer you. That's the extent of how some people seek to grow the local body. It doesn't. We don't need to be concerned with those things. We don't need to be concerned with the numbers on the board. We don't need to be concerned with the, the money coming in with the contribution. We need to be concerned with the people getting to heaven. And the only way we can really achieve a maximum number of people getting to heaven is we're going to have to change our preferences. We need to have Christ's criteria. Not, you know, are, are, we, are we morally in agreement? We're going to get that point. We're going to be in moral agreement later after you've learned the gospel and you've converted to the gospel. But up front... If I go out evangelizing, me and someone don't have to agree eye to eye on abortion right then and there for me to decide whether or not I'm going to preach them the gospel. Or do they agree with me fundamentally? I don't need to go out and, and look for someone who, the moment I meet them, they're not a member of the Lord's church. Maybe they're Eastern Orthodox. So the Eastern Orthodox believe in baptism. And that baptism is essential for salvation. They have a whole lot of other things wrong. If I come across someone who's Eastern Orthodox, I'm not going to be like, oh, great, man, you believe in baptism for salvation? I can evangelize to you. And then go meet someone else who, for instance, is a Baptist, and they say, no, I believe you're saved by faith, and baptism is outward showing, go, oh, that doctrine. And then have nothing to do with it. We cannot do those things. We need to have the criteria of Christ, which is, are they lost in sin? Do they need the gospel? Are they in need of Jesus? That's the criteria Jesus used. That's the criteria we ought to use. Now, 34 through 36. We need to change our perspective. If you're, if you're going to evangelize like Jesus, change your perspective. Verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not know or do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already, the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. There's a change of mind, a change of perspective that takes place. Look at how Jesus is looking at things. Verse 34, he is viewing his work as the fulfillment of his bodily needs. It's a figure of speech, but he's saying that it is so important to him. He is unsatisfied if he's not doing his work of evangelism, of bringing the lost unto him so that they could have the forgiveness of sins, so they could have redemption in his name. It is tied to what he desires, what he craves, what he needs. Verse 35, he looked, he looks ahead expect, expectantly. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? The figure of speech. People go out, they plant, and they say, well, we got four months and the harvest is coming. What do you think they're going to do in four months? They're going to go harvest. They're going to go into the field. They're going to reap what they've sown. They've expected it to grow. Jesus 
was looking at the situation here, right? Now we understand that in verses 27 uh, through 33, is it? There's been a derailment. Jesus' disciples show up and they say, Rabbi, are you hungry? No, I, I have food. Who gave him food? Where is he? Why is he saying this? How does he come up with this? And then he points, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. They know that he'd been having a conversation with this Samaritan woman. He's saying, I planted the seed. Now my seed's going. Now I'm about to yield in the harvest. I'm about to, I'm about to reap a great harvest. And that's the way we need to be looking at things. We need to be looking at things the way that Jesus is looking at things. Jesus is looking at, you know, his work as the fulfillment of his life. That's exactly how we need to look at it. The Christian life should be our only life. We shouldn't have divided lives. With these people, I'm a Christian. With these people, I'm a sports enthusiast. With these people, I'm a foodie. I'm a Christian all the time. Which means our work dominates our life. I am here to work for him. Like Paul said, Philippians 1 verse 21. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. We need to look ahead with expectation of saving souls. The souls which are around us. They are the harvest. And you know what? Like Jesus, continue there in verse 35. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Here it is. He's planted the seed. He's looking at these Samaritans and he's saying, here they come. Souls to be saved. That's how we need to look at it. We need to genuinely believe that the people around us are souls. Every single one of them. No matter where they live, no matter what background they have, no matter what lifestyle they're currently living, they are crops crying for harvest. We need to have a complete change of perspective. My time needs to be viewed as time to complete his will, to accomplish his will. Jesus had that mentality. And Jesus had that mentality for his disciples. Notice in John 9 and verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. We, he's saying, me and my disciples need to go and do the will of the Father while there's still opportunity, while there's still time. Complete change of perspective. My time is time to do His will. I see people as prospects with a prospective yield. Common sign or common sign down here. Go to go to any Stripes gas station. Walk inside. Someone's going to have a face tattoo. Half the time, someone's going to have a skull tattoo. Cartel lifestyle. A lot of people that we're seeing with those type of things, actually, they're trying to lead that lifestyle and not lead it, that lifestyle. See a bunch of cartel guys every once in a while driving junky cars. They've done their time in prison. They've wised up. They've matured. Yes, they have the scars. They're not trying to live that life. We can't just look at those people and go, yeah, you can't climb Jesus in my church. Can't do that. We have to see them as a soul. Someone that genuinely we believe I can help to convert this person to Christ. I can help bring this person to Christ. I can teach them the gospel. Make them respond to the gospel. Don't count someone out before you even try to share the gospel. Another thing is, I see all souls around me as an opportunity. Sometimes we lose opportunities with people of their own will. Try to share the gospel with them and close the door in our face, physically or metaphorically. End of discussion. We're not talking about it. 
sometimes we lose the opportunity ourselves. The gospel tells us what to do whenever we go to someone's house, and we lose that opportunity to dust your feet off. Sometimes we're dusting our feet off before we even get to the house. We're completely unfaithful. And that needs to change. The fourth bonus point for you. I'm not going to go through a long explanation, but just look with me quickly in verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of a woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed with them two days. Just very briefly, change your priorities. Put someone's salvation needs above your own personal needs. Paul talks about that, becoming all things to all people that might win some. He's talking about giving up his rights. He's talking about giving up his time, his energy. It's exactly what Jesus did. It's what we ought to be willing to do. <coughs> Jesus is the master teacher for a reason. One of which <clears throat> is that he is actually willing to teach people. As crazy as that seems, he is willing to teach people. Are we willing to teach people also? Are we Are willing to teach the people around us? Are we willing to teach the people that don't look like us, don't live like us? Are we willing to do those things? If we're really like Jesus in the business of selling, uh, saving souls, then we will. We will go to the people who don't look like us. We will go to the people who don't live like us. We will go to the people who are in the world, all of them, and we will share the gospel with them. Encouragement for each and every one of us, myself included, I'm stepping on toes, I'm stomping on my feet, okay? Go and share the gospel without partiality, without respect of persons. Share it unashamedly, just like Jesus. This evening, if anybody has a need of the congregation, a need of prayers, a need of study, we would love to help you with those things. If you're outside of Christ and you're seeking salvation in Him, Understand he is the only way, Acts 4 and verse 12. He is the way to the Father, John 14 and verse 6. And to be saved by him, the way Peter put it, Acts 3 and verse 19, you need to repent and be converted. The way he put it before that, Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Is there a need? You can come and make that known as together we stand as we sing.